to the organizers. This has been a wonderful uh, workshop so far. I've learned a lot, and I hope to uh, interest you in what I'm going to tell you about today. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging my collaborators, uh, Vincenzo Vitelli, who's now at Chicago, uh, Brian Chen, who's at uh, Penn, as is Tom Lubensky, uh, Tom Soon Martin is now at MIT, uh, Xiaoming Mao, my one-time postdoc advisor, is at Michigan. Uh, also, Kai Sun is her student. Uh, Shang Nan Zhao is at Stanford now. And uh, what I want to tell you about today at the end, uh, assuming I make it to it, is work I did uh, with my own student, Adrian Ceremi, uh, at Georgia Tech. So uh, I want to just preview the main results here, which is that if I have a uh, mechanical system uh, such as this, rigid pieces joined together by hinges, uh, and I want to know what types of modes it can have. There is a mechanical critical condition where I can count the number of constraints, the number of degrees of freedom, and it turns out to be very different for periodic structures than we'd have for disordered structures. And it can give us uh, new types of modes that live uh, not only at uh, the boundaries of a surface uh, of a bulk material, but also at lower dimensional elements of the surface, like uh, corners or uh, hinges of three-dimensional surfaces. Of course, I encourage you to ask questions uh, if anything's unclear. So uh, as motivation, uh, our society's always relied on mechanics, as have uh, all biological entities, uh, from the ancient to the modern and to the uh, future. This is a pentamode material, and I really like the way uh, Mark put it the other day of uh, the material as a machine. So can we design a material? Can we design some sort of regular structure that uh, performs the mechanical operation that we want? Uh, we're also doing mechanics at uh, small and smaller length scales, so we can make uh, hinges out of DNA beams. We can use them to do potentially useful things, like releasing drugs at particular points in the body. Uh, we have other ways of controlling uh, structure at this scale. We can do nanolithography. Uh, we can do self-assembly. Uh, we heard an example of that in the previous talk. Uh, and what I want to bring into that now is topological protection. So we had a nice discussion uh, that centered on uh, topological defects in liquid crystals, so uh, it seems like in this conference you want to have at least one picture of a liquid crystal. And here the idea is that if I follow the director field of the crystal around, I know whether there's going to be a defect. And I can't remove that defect without changing the director field uh, all over. I can't do that as a local operation. And what I'm talking about now is very much in the same spirit mathematically, uh, but what those functions refer to are very different things. So these are defects that I can show you in real space. You can snap a picture of them with the right polarizer. What I'm going to be talking about, uh, the solutions of my topological equations are modes now. So a particular way of deforming is a solution in the same way that that uh, defect is something that blows up there. And the way we can control those um, is most fully developed in uh, the electronic community, so quantum electronic equations of motion. I'm going to talk about how we can do it uh, with uh, mechanical systems, which are a lot easier in the sense that we can just uh, choose new shapes rather than having to find the right uh, substance that has a particular shape for its quantum mechanical uh, wave functions. So a brief contrast between dynamics and statics. What I'm talking about today uh, is statics. And so in dynamics, we have Newton's equations of motion that describe how if I give you a set of displacements and deformations, you can give me the return forces. And often that leads to uh, wave propagation. And that can lead to topologic or protected boundary modes. So this is an interface uh, between two topologically distinct parts of a structure. And you have a mode that can go around corners without backscattering or localizing as a result of that. In statics, I want to talk about a slightly different thing. I want to talk about a system that is constrained in some way. So I have mechanical constraints. I need that these triangles have to uh, share corners as if they're connected by hinges. And I'm going to let my system relax to a force balanced static configuration. And it turns out we can still have topologically protected boundary modes that resemble these in some ways, but are different in others. So constraint equations are not just mechanical, so I want to just briefly highlight some other situations where you can have that. So often that uh, involves something flowing in and out of nodes, whether it's a macroscopic fluid, uh, electrical current, or a probability current, as in this a uh, stochastic uh, active system that evolves between different states of uh, uh, methylated uh, biological structure. And uh, then you can also have a magnetic system. So this is a system with a mechanical analog where you have the orientations of uh, spins, and they correspond to the orientations of creases in an origami. So 
in a preprint we have, we uh, turn that magnetic system into an origami system. Uh, but the main event from my perspective is mechanics. So our degrees of freedom are the positions and orientations of different uh, rigid elements. So for orientations, we can have uh, geared materials where the constraints couple not just the relative positions, but the relative orientations of the gears. We can also have origami where we have the positions and the orientations of faces that are joined together at creases. Um, but really, all I want to talk about today with you can be done with the simplest possible mechanical system, which is just a bunch of point particles with no internal structure that are joined together by simple central force springs. So uh, the notion of counting up the ways that we can deform such a structure uh, goes back to uh, James Clerk Maxwell in 1864, and he was concerned about making sure that uh, bridges weren't going to fall over, that bridges were stable. And the counting just goes like this. I have two particles in two dimensions. That's four degrees of freedom. I add a central force spring between them, and now I have gone from four zero modes to three zero modes. I can translate, translate, rotate, but stretching or compressing is now going to cost energy. It's going to uh, stretch or compress the spring. And Maxwell was aware that this counting argument didn't tell you everything. He knew that you could have a structure like this, which is rigid, so there's no cost to changing the angle between bonds, only changing the distance of the bonds. But this structure, which has the same number of bonds, is not rigid. We can shear the bottom square. But he didn't have a mathematical explanation for uh, when that redundancy did and didn't occur. That came over 100 years later. And we can get that from describing things in terms of what's called the rigidity matrix or the compatibility matrix. So this describes the constraints I was talking about before. So if I give you a set of site displacements, and I know the initial positions of all the sites, and I know which of them are bonded, then you can tell me, uh, to linear order, how much each bond is going to be extended or compressed. And that's going to be a linear map. That's going to be a matrix. And then there's another matrix. There's a related one. It's the transpose of the original matrix. And that matrix tells me that if I give you the tensions in the bonds, you can tell me that the tensions turn into forces along the length of the bond, how much force is going to be on in each site. If I put those two notions together, I get the dynamics. So the dynamics is just R transpose R, the dynamical matrix. If you give me the displacements, I can give you the return forces. But we're going to see that it's quite useful to keep track, rather, of the bond extensions, in part because we're removing bonds at the boundary, and the dynamical matrix doesn't tell us what happens if we remove bonds, and in part because this is a more general object. In particular, this rigidity matrix doesn't have to be a square matrix. It can be a rectangle if we have more sites than bonds, or vice versa. So, so that mathematical relation, which was also uh, on display in uh, Dan's talk earlier, uh, says that if I know the number of degrees of freedom and the number of bonds, I also know how many zero modes there are and how many self-stresses there are. So a zero mode is a set of displacements that does not stretch any bond. A self-stress is sort of the inverse. It's a set of bond tensions that does not generate any force on an object. And this uh, theorem, which comes purely from linear algebra, purely from the fact that those two matrices are transposes of one another, is that every time I add a constraint, I have to either remove a zero mode or create a self-stress. So here, if I move that bond uh, from the top square to the bottom square, I create a zero mode that's shearing the top square, but I also create a set of tensions in the bottom square that generate no net force. So this brings us to the 1D chain. So this is the picture of rotors coupled together by springs that goes back to uh, Kane Lebensky's work in 2013. We created a similar one that doesn't uh, need the uh, fixed substrate there. Here, and if we do our Maxwell counting with this, I'm going to find that this should have exactly one floppy mode. There should be some way of deforming this that does not stretch any bonds, that does not deform any of these triangles that are joined together by hinges. And the question is, where is that floppy mode? So I have a floppy mode because I've removed bonds at the left edge and the right edge. So I'm guessing it should be on either the left edge or the right edge. Which one is it? And for me, it's not easy to tell. I can, I can feel, and I'll be able to feel where it is. But just looking at the structure, you can't just guess where it is. And to develop that answer, I want to think about what type of mode we can have. So if we have a periodic structure, uh, Bloch's theorem tells us that we have to have periodic solutions. And I was at a workshop that a couple of you were at uh, last week where we were looking at similar topological states of matter in more complicated structures that were not periodic. And people kept saying, oh, we don't have Bloch's theorem. Oh, we don't have Bloch's theorem. And they were saying that because it's really useful. It tells us 
that we should always have modes that are just getting multiplied by a phase factor as we move across our system. But it's a little more complicated if we have open boundary conditions. Those are all the modes we need if we have periodic boundary conditions. But with open boundary conditions, if you repeat the logic of Bloch's theorem, this phase factor is actually just a complex number. It doesn't have to be a pure phase factor. So I could have a solution that's doubling every time I move across the cell. And it's just allowed here if I have open boundary conditions that it's going to be exponentially larger on the right edge than on the left edge. That's going to be a mode that exists on the right edge. So that's allowed by a more general picture of Bloch's theorem. So we can have modes that, depending on the value of this complex number, this e to the ik, they're either in the bulk, they're on the right edge, or they're on the left edge. And in particular, for what we call a Maxwell lattice, which is a lattice that has the same number of constraints as degrees of freedom, that means our rigidity matrix is a square matrix, and we can look for zero modes just by taking the determinant. And if we express our rigidity matrix mathematically as a function of these z1 and z2 complex numbers, if I fix one of them, so I just have one left, then I'm always going to have solutions. This is just an algebraic equation. Fundamental theorem of algebra says that I'll have some solutions in the complex plane. And since they're anywhere in the complex plane, I'm not guaranteed that they're bulk solutions. They won't show up with periodic boundary conditions. But if I cut this out so that I have edge modes, then I'm going to be guaranteed to have them on one edge or another. So what's topological about this? So we're trying to solve this equation. We're just trying to solve when some function of z is equal to 0. So I have a complex map from the complex plane back to itself. And I can think of these solutions. I'm just showing them as red dots. And if the red dot is in the unit circle, that corresponds to a mode on the left edge. If it's outside, it's on the right edge. And complex analysis just says that since we have an analytic function here, I can follow its phase around this circle. And that will tell me how many 0 modes I have on the left edge there. So the winding of the phase field of the bulk constraints across the Brion zone tells us how many zero modes we have. So if I do this calculation, it will tell me, I'll do the calculation, I'll either get one or zero for the number of zero modes on the left edge. And if I feel this, this edge is stiff. It's, it's a little wobbly here, just because the joints are loose now. But if I feel this one, it actually has a nonlinear motion, has a soliton-like kink. I can push this through. And now this side is stiff. It wasn't soft because it had yellow triangles. It was soft because of the orientations of them. And this side now has the zero mode. So we've undergone a topological transition uh, right here. So that's the basic logic of what I want to talk about today. There are plenty of wrinkles to it. And one of the first wrinkles is we mostly care about not just one-dimensional structures, but two- or three-dimensional structures. And when we repeat this analysis, we don't use what is the most typically used uh, topological invariant by uh, physicists, uh, or at least hard condensed matter physicists, in 2D, which is the churn number. What we do instead is we just treat it as an essentially one-dimensional system, where we just hold the transverse wave vector constant. And we go through, we go across, and we calculate this number. And it'll tell us how many zero modes we have on the left edge versus the right edge, and how many zero modes we have on the bottom edge versus the top edge. So. I want to uh, show you one way we can do that. So one of the nice things about these structures is that because they're just at the point of mechanical stability, we're guaranteed, uh, based on results from uh, Guess and Hutchinson in 2003, that we're going to have some way of deforming them. So that's what we call a guess mode. So there's some way of deforming this structure uniformly without stretching any bonds. And the nice thing about this for our purposes is that we can deform it through a point like this, where we have a straight line of bonds. A straight line of bonds corresponds to a self-stress in the bulk, which by our index theorem also means that we're going to have a zero mode in the bulk. So we have zero modes in the bulk here, which suggests that they've gone from one edge to the other edge as we pass through this transition. So we can control the structure of uh, our system in this way, and we can try to induce a topological transition. That's right. So it's a nonlinear operation changing the system, but at each point we look for the linear zero modes. Yeah. So if we play a video here, so everyone on this collaboration uh, is a theoretical physicist, so it needed to be really simple for us to be able to make it. Uh, we made it out of connects, which are plastic toys. And here, here's our sort of artist conception here, but what's left are these connects, 
piece is joined by hinges, and I'm just pushing on it here, and it crumples. If I push on it anywhere on this edge, it's going to crumple because it has nonlinear zero modes because it's just at the isostatic point in the bulk, and it's missing bonds on the edge. So we can go through and we can crumple it on both edges. And then we uh, engage in the procedure that I showed you there where we're pulling on it, and we're pulling on it with these rods on the boundaries, and we're introducing a fair amount of disorder because we don't have great control over the boundaries. We didn't bother to do it. Uh, and then the question is, uh, we tried to introduce a topological polarization, and if we did that, we took all the zero modes from this side to that side, and so now, even though this is undercoordinated locally, it shouldn't have any zero modes. And when I push on it, it's not infinitely stiff, but it's stiff enough now to support its own weight as it slides across the table uh, without buckling. And we, we didn't measure it precisely, but just from feeling it, it felt, you know, maybe 10 times stiffer. You know, in theory, you know, in theory, it should be much, much stiffer because in theory, it should be going from actually stressing the uh, connects pieces, which are quite hard, to rotating the hinges, which are quite soft. So in theory, it should be a really big buildup, you know, we did our simulations where we had orders of magnitude build up. In practice, you know, it's 3, 10, something like that times stiffer. And when people have 3D printed it, they haven't seen even that because they don't have the good hinges. They just have narrow bits. So now we come to a real wrinkle in our one-dimensional scheme for uh, two-dimensional systems, which is that we can't necessarily just calculate this one-dimensional winding number and have it always come out the same way. And it turns out that if we make a lattice that's just a little bit more complicated, we just add in a few extra degrees of freedom per cell, keeping it at the Maxwell point, then we can have vial points. And these vial points are isolated points in the Brion zone that occur at finite wave vector and have zero modes. So we have zero modes, we have linear dispersion around them. That's a frequency dispersion of the phonon modes. And we have this problem now where if I calculate the winding number by going across the Brion zone, I wanted to say that any time I calculate the winding number, it's going to be the same answer because I can just deform it from one to another. But I can't deform it across the vial point. It's actually topologically protected itself. So here, I get different values of my winding number if I try to evaluate them at different points in the Brion zone. So this is a hint that the two-dimensional system is a bit more complicated than we would have just from calculating the 1D topological invariant. Yes? So the, the, the Kagome doesn't have it, and for a while we were trying to figure out why it doesn't. It turns out there's a representation of the Kagome where you can show that it's just so simple that there's no way to put a vial point in. You can reduce it from something that looks like a 6 by 6 matrix into something that looks like a 2 by 2 matrix with some tricks. And then once you do it, it's just not a complicated enough structure to have that. It's not a symmetry. It's just that you're trying to build up an algebraic equation and you just don't have enough terms to control how, 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 how complicated an algebraic equation you can have. It's just from the simplicity of it, not from a symmetry of it. Yeah, it, it took us a while to figure that out. Um, so with these vowel points, they first of all represent an alternative way to change the topological polarization because we can pull them across the Brune zone and they can't just disappear. They're topologically protected as long as we don't add any extra bonds in, as long as we're just changing the configuration of the bonds we have. We can't just create or destroy them willy-nilly, but they have negative top, they have opposite topological charges, so they can be created and destroyed in pairs at the origin, and they can also be created and destroyed at the corners of the Brion zone where they annihilate with something uh, from the next Brion zone over. So what this mode looks like, this mode that again is isolated and is occurring at a finite wave vector in the unit cell, is we get this uh, sinusoidal pattern that's at some direction that has nothing to do with the original lattice direction, and that's some spacing that has nothing to do with the spacing of the original lattice, and that in fact we can tune by pushing the Brion zone across. So what we can do is we can create a new elastic instability that's not occurring in the long wavelength limit of the original theory, uh, and it's just there, and we can tune it. It also has implications for the edge, because these uh, zero modes that are occurring in the bulk are actually part of a chain of zero modes that are stretching from ones that are exponentially localized on one edge to ones that are exponentially localized on the other. And what that means for the theory of the edge is that on this edge, we can actually have the situation where it doesn't have any zero modes at uh, long wavelengths, but it does at short wavelengths, or vice versa. So we can create and remove by wavelength zero modes at the edge. So a lot of interesting behavior we can have with this. Um, and uh, Daniel uh, took this to a bit of an extreme uh, where they looked at very large 
uh, unit cells that were representing Jan packings. And they found, uh, so as Siraj said, with the Kagome, you never have vial points. With the deformed square lattice that I looked at in the previous slide, you either have zero pairs or one pair. If you make the unit cell larger, you can have you know, 20, 40, 60 pairs, apparently. And in fact, the probability of having no pairs gets very small. So the probability of actually having a well-defined topological polarization that you don't find some way of fine-tuning for starts to vanish with these large cells. So there's something incomplete about this. This isn't a true generic uh, topological invariant, this 1D winding number for 2D. So I was interested in seeing if there was something that was a bit more robust. Uh, and then also, there was another problem that was bothering me, which was uh, these, all these examples and all of the papers that I didn't have time to talk about that other people did uh, following up on this were for Maxwell lattices. They were exactly the isostatic point, which is not generally true of most of the lattices we encounter in real life. And I was wondering if there was something topological we could say about the mechanics of structures that were not at the Maxwell point. And uh, this is where the new work comes in, the one that is just on the archive now. And this is work that really takes advantage of the fact that we have a periodic structure. So I'm going to make a new counting argument. And my new counting argument is what space of modes do I have? The space of modes I have is the number of degrees of freedom I have in the cell. And then I'm going to subtract one off because this is a linear theory, so I don't care if I just doubled the size of the mode. That doesn't count as a new mode. But then I'm also going to say, well, my modes are changing as I move in n directions. So in two dimensions, I can move in up to two directions. And I can say, maybe I'm doubling as I move in that direction. Maybe I'm having as I move in that direction. So my space of modes is actually not just the number of degrees of freedom in the cell. I also need to count the dimensions I have to play with as a space of modes. So if I want to say, what is the size of my space of modes? How many constraints do I need to get to the point where I'd expect to have isolated zeros? I actually have this number, which is uh, different. So this is what I call uh, nth order Maxwell criticality. And it's based on uh, not just the number of constraints and the number of degrees of freedom, but uh, how many uh, dimensions you're in. So just to go through the examples. So first order is just the polarization that Kane Lubensky saw and that I was talking about on the previous slide. And this is the number of constraints equals the number of degrees of freedom because of this kind of coincidence that we have to remove uh, one constraint uh, from the fact that we have linearity, but then we're also one dimension. So what that means in one, two, or three dimensions lower is that if I have that critical condition, I expect to have zero modes on the surface. So on the 2D surface of a 3D structure, 1D surface of a 2D structure, zero dimensional surface of a one-dimensional structure like this. For second-order criticality, it's different. It's Maxwell plus one. We need one extra constraint per cell. I can just add one more constraint to one of my previous lattices. And what this implies is now that there are two ways in which the mode has to be growing or shrinking. So I can have a mode then that's exponentially localized to a corner of a 2D structure or of the hinge or edge of a 3D structure. And I can keep going. I can add an extra constraint per cell. And then I would have corner modes in a 3D structure. And if I want to go higher than that, I need to find some way to come up with another dimension, which would be embedding a 4D structure in 3D or somehow using time as a dimension if I'm taking this through a set of structures periodically. So my minimal model is a set of quadrilateral pieces, so more advanced than the triangles. Now I got up to four sides uh, that are joined together at hinges. And if I have this, I have a nonlinear mode with just this one that is a shearing of the plaquette on the inside. And if I start to staple these together, the angle at which I shear this one has to mean that as this angle increases, this one decreases. So there's a constraint there, and there's also going to be a constraint above it. So if I think of the degree of freedom as how much I'm shearing the inner plaquette, which ends up being the easiest way to do the counting because it gives you a 2 by 1 matrix instead of a 5 by 4 matrix, I have this 2 by 1 matrix, which is simple but still problematic because it's not a square matrix. I can't just keep taking determinants anymore. It doesn't have a determinant. So if I do the naive Maxwell counting, it will say, well, you have one extra uh, constraint per cell. should be really rigid. Kane lubensky winding number, can't do it. I can't calculate the determinant of a 2 by 1 matrix. Uh, but if we do something nonlinear, it turns out that we do indeed uh, get a topological number. And what that topological number is telling us is the location of this uh, corner mode. So this is a mode that is exponentially uh, shrinking as I move to the right and as I move up. And the different colors just mean that the mode is changing sign as I move side by side. It's anti-ferromagnetic in that sense. The arrows here indicate that if I just cut off the bottom edge, it would be topologically polarized pointing in this direction. 
left column, topologically polarized, pointing in this direction. So how's this topological? The Kane-Lebensky polarization was a map of the one-dimensional Brillouin zone to another realization of S1, the one sphere, which was the phase of a complex function. And it turns out that if you just count how many times this maps to this, that tells you how many zero modes you have on the left edge with some details about uh, what gauge you have to be in. It turns out there's a lot more homotopy groups of spheres, and a lot of them are trivial. A lot of them are like trying to map a one sphere to a two sphere, which doesn't do anything because you can't lasso a basketball. Every uh, mode shrinks into a single point, and all of the Kane-Lebensky stuff is right here, uh, but we're going to use more of this table of topological invariants. It's just uh, waiting there to be put to work. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the details here, but we have a space of modes. We have a space of constraints. So our constraint map is now a nonlinear map because it depends not just on our linear mode, but also on these numbers of how much it's growing and shrinking. We have a space of modes that correspond to the lower left-hand corner. We do an integral over the boundary of those modes, which corresponds to the adjoining edges. So by looking to see if we have something in the lower left-hand corner, we're doing a topological calculation based on the polarization of the lower edge and the left edge. And we're relying on our uh, mechanical criticality to make sure that we have something non-trivial. And what it tells us is exactly the number of zero modes in the corner that we care about. Uh, it tells us that for topological reasons that also rely on the fact that we have uh, holomorphic functions. And when we check this, we get exactly what we expect. We can actually work it out and say, this is exactly when we should have modes, this is when we shouldn't have modes, and we calculate the topological invariance, and we uh, get what we we're supposed to get. So I'm out of time, so I just want to show you really quickly that uh, if we actually make this, it works. So I can make this. It's rigid. It feels rigid everywhere. It feels rigid on all the edges. But I have this one corner, and this one corner wiggles like a loose tooth. So this one corner is really soft. Everything else is quite stiff. And it's because of this topological mode. And we can do some stuff with this. We can use this as a sort of mechanical amplifier, where if I wiggle this, it's stiff, but it's moving further in the soft corner because I have this mode. It's less sensitive here because we tuned it so that it would grow more. This is just showing that when we take pictures of it and we measure the displacement of the hinges, we get that it agrees like 90% with what we would expect from the topological mode. So even though there's clear nonlinearities here, I'm rotating this through a pretty big angle. There's disorder, there's friction. It's still accurately describing the mechanical response. So we have this thing where we can make this. It can be the part of a larger uh, structure. We can use it to examine new topological invariants. It's very easy to say, I have a set of equations. What are the mechanical structures I can design that realize them? Uh, and then we can look and say, maybe there are more topological invariants that mean something on this table. Uh, dynamic modes I'll skip. So I've run over time. So thank you very much.